But I'm glad that you're here today. Uh, this is a continuation of, of our discipleship classes that we do on Sunday morning. And uh, today it's entitled, Fellowship Matters, uh, Living in a Bond of Unity. And so I'm glad that you're here today. And our key passage is going to come out of Acts chapter 2. Um, this is going to be probably more topical than what I'm uh, used to doing. But uh, it'll be very uh, helpful and very uh, insightful, uh, I trust and I pray. As we get started today, let's open up in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, how we thank you again for this day and how we uh, praise you for the uh, glorious day that you have given us, not only uh, to be in a uh, beautiful creation, but to be able to come uh, to a gospel preaching church and to be able to fellowship with uh, brothers and sisters in Christ and to worship together and to serve together. Father, I just pray that you will uh, do something supernatural in each of our hearts and lives today as we study your word, as we worship, uh, as we uh, go about our daily uh, interaction with our fellow believers. And I pray, Lord, that you will shape us and equip us and mold us to be the people of God that you have called us and created us uh, to be. And may it be all for your glory. I pray, Lord, that you will meet us here in this uh, time of, of discipleship, that you would teach us and remind us what you would have us to know and, and to learn and to do. And I pray, Father, that all that we say and do in this class will uh, bring honor and glory to your name and that we would clear out anything in our heart, anything in our life that would be a distraction that we might be able to hear your voice and as you speak to us that we would respond in accordance with your good and perfect will. For it's in your name that we pray and ask these things. Amen. And amen. All right, fellowship matters. Hope everybody's got an outline this morning and I will try to do my best to uh, stick pretty close to that outline. I know that some of you if uh, I don't give you the right answer or you don't get the blank filled out, uh, it will be traumatic for you. So I will try to do my best to uh, get those lines uh, filled out for you. If I skip over something, just remind me and I'll come back to it. But I think uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be all right this morning. Uh, but this morning we uh, will be discussing uh, fellowship within the church. Uh, specifically how church members love each other based upon the bond of unity that God has formed in us. Uh, what do these relationships look like in a spiritual, supernatural community? That's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, sometimes when we talk about fellowship in the church, uh, what kind of comes to your mind? If I say, man, we're going to have a fellowship tonight. Potluck, that's exactly right. Uh, you know, some Baptist churches, when you join them, uh, they not only give you a welcome packet, but they give you a casserole dish. Uh, supposedly, you're supposed to bring that to all the different potlucks uh, that, we, that we have, you know. And I will tell you, as a pastor, potlucks are, are, are deadly. Uh, you know, when I started this back in the early 80s, uh, I was a thin guy, believe that or not. And uh, so any kind of weight gain I have, uh, I write that up to uh, being married because when I was single, I just ate one meal a day and it was lunch. Uh, then when I got married, Joan was uh, bound and determined that I would eat a uh, big breakfast, that I would eat something for lunch, and then she would prepare a meal for me in the evening. Uh, I didn't know what to do with all that food, man. It was just like... Uh, somebody in poverty all of a sudden being at a, at a banquet hall or something. And, uh, and then, you know, you start pastoring a church and you go to these potlucks and, man, everybody wants to feed you. And, uh, if you don't eat somebody's dish or if you don't eat somebody's dessert, uh, they'll be mad at you. So, uh, you know, I almost wanted to go to those things and just say, man, I'm fasting. I'm not going to eat anybody's anything. Uh, but uh, anyhow, sometimes we think about potlucks. Sometimes we think about... Uh, Wednesday night, the fellowship meal. Uh, I think for some of us, man, it's kind of uh, wrapped around some sort of a, some sort of a meal. Uh, sometimes it could be a fellowship that we might have 
uh, like a golf tournament, golf scramble that we're going to have here in a, in a few weeks. And uh, so, so fellowship, we, we oftentimes think about it being something that might be fun, uh, something that might be uh, uh, surface in, in communication with each other. Uh, the church picnic that we had, uh, you know, I talked to a lot of different people, but I don't know that I really got below the surface uh, with anybody. But it was a, it was a major fellowship time. And uh, so, so sometimes I think we, when we talk about fellowship matters, we, we, we think about those things, and those things are important. But uh, really when you look at it from a biblical perspective, there is something that is vital, there is something that is in key when we have fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's not just coming and eating a big meal and burping and going home. Uh, it, you know, it's a whole lot more uh, than that. If you have your Bible, I want you to go to Acts chapter 2 this morning. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 begins with the coming of the Holy Spirit. You remember that when Jesus ascended back to his Father in heaven, he said that uh, after a period of time, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you shall be my witnesses. Uh, witnesses literally around the world. Uh, the Holy Spirit would come and empower those believers to be a gospel witness, to go on mission and to do those things that God had called them to do. They were going to be empowered supernaturally by the Holy Spirit. That's what happened at the start of Acts chapter 2. And then... At the end of that chapter, uh, we read a, uh, those last few verses uh, commonly called the fellowship of believers. What did these believers do in community with each other? Notice what the scripture says in verse 42 of Acts chapter 2. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. We're talking here about fellowship. The fellowship of believers. Living in a, in a bond of unity. Notice the scripture says they devoted themselves. And then in verse 44, all who believed were together. They had all things in common. They devoted themselves. Now, that devoted is an important word. Uh, if you look at it in the uh, dictionary, uh, you will find that uh, devoted simply means uh, very loving or very loyal. Some of the synonyms for devoted would be that of being faithful, true, uh, being constant, being committed, uh, being uh, dedicated, being devout. You know, this was not just a, a take it or leave it uh, commitment. This was not just a uh, come when you want to type of a fellowship. You don't see in this passage people kind of coming and going at will. You don't see people kind of coming and going when it was convenient. No, they were devoted. They were devoted to this fellowship. Now, what is so important about this 
fellowship. What is so important about this fellowship, this body of believers called Buck Run Baptist Church? What is so vital? What makes Christian fellowship different from worldly relationships? Think of it in this term. What, uh, what makes Buck Run Baptist Church different than the Lions Club? What makes it different than some association that you might be uh, involved with? Any ideas? We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. Yeah, yeah. And the sharing of the gospel. Yeah, I mean, you know, we are, you know, in this fellowship of believers, man, we have been born again. We are believers in Christ. We are a new creation in Christ. The old is gone. The new has come. And what makes us that is the Holy Spirit. Yeah, Holy Spirit, you know, dwelling in us. Uh, you know, what do we have in common other than our salvation? We have a common mission, right? It's called the Great Commission. You know, the purpose of us being together is not just so that we can uh, look pretty and, and, and pat each other on the back and, and, and have a bunch of, of caring relationships. I mean, that's important and that's good, and we're going to talk about that here in a second. But, you know, primarily we are together to make disciples. That means that uh, not only are we saved, but man, we want to encourage each other. We want to, to learn. We want to grow together. And we don't want just to be a reservoir of the gospel message. No, we want to go on mission with the gospel. We want to go. This is a unique fellowship. There is no other fellowship quite like the church. There are a lot of good organizations. There are a lot of good things to belong to. But nothing is life-changing with an eternal consequence than the fellowship of believers. Believers in Christ. And in Acts chapter 2, you have these believers that were together and they devoted themselves to this fellowship. They devoted themselves to each other. And so uh, in those first few blanks on your handout, don't forget to put in devoted to fellowship. Now what are the characteristics of a healthy relationship in the church? What characterizes healthy relationships in the church. A very simple, very profound word. It is the word love. It is the word love. Is it not true? We have been recipients of God's love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. God demonstrates his love towards us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so we have this word, love. Now, why is love so important? Why is it so important? Well, John gives us a glimpse of it in, in John 13, uh, 34 and 35, if you have your Bible and want to turn over to that. Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you. Again, he's talking about these that were going to be his disciples, these that were going to come and, and follow after him. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And then notice that last sentence, verse 35. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have 
perfect attendance in Sunday school. If you have perfect attendance in the worship service. If you come to church on Wednesday night. Somebody said, man, if you really love the church, um, or if you love, yeah, if you love the church, you'll come on Sunday morning. If you love the pastor, you'll come on Sunday night. If you love Jesus, you'll come on Wednesday night. Uh, now, I don't know if that's true or not, but, uh, you know, nowhere in here is the Scripture saying anything about our works or our efforts. Why? Because the Bible says those things are as filthy rags. But what it does say is that by this all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. If you have love for one another. I mean, you just glance at this, and, and what just screams out at you is that if we are true believers, if we are true followers of Christ, if we are true disciples, what is going to characterize our life is that we're going to have a genuine, sincere love for one another. Now, does that mean that we are going to be best friends with everyone? Man, I wish I could be. I'd love to spend time with every member of Buck Run Baptist Church. But the truth of the matter is, there's only 24 hours in a day. And there's just not enough time. I wish that there were. But I will tell you, there's not a person at Buck Run Baptist Church that if there were a need that I knew something about, I wouldn't have a genuine love for them or a concern, or a compassion for them. And even those that are outside the fellowship, those that are yet believers, man, when I look at the wreck and the, the lostness of their life, there, there, there's, a, there, there's a, a, a love. I'm fixing to start dealing with a whole lot of kiddos. Matter of fact, this week I got a new assignment. Man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be introduced to a whole lot of kiddos. And these kiddos do not have a, a, a great reputation. Uh, it, it, they're rough. But yet when I, when I look at their faces, when I come into contact with them here in a few days, you know, I'm praying, Lord, help me to look past the externals. Help me to, to see them as a child that you have created. A child that is in desperate need of a saving relationship with you. And I pray that what I say and what I do will be loving towards them. Now, I understand there's going to have to be some correction. We're going to have to have a few of those come to Jesus meetings when, uh, you know, you, you have to correct some behavior. But, you know, I want to do what is right and what is loving towards them. I think I've told you before, you know, there are kids that come to school and, um, man, they just don't have much at all. And I've put shoes on feet. I've put clothes on their, on their body. I, this summer, man, I've made sure that uh, some of the ones that I knew about uh, had food to eat because uh, some of them just come from uh, just a real poverty kind of a situation. But what is that? It is love. As I have received God's love, man, I want to extend God's love that the world will know that I am a believer because of a genuine love for one another. Now, why is this so important? Well, first of all, God is glorified when we love across societal boundaries. He's glorified when we love across societal boundaries. You know, it's easy to love somebody that's just like you, right? I mean, if they're just like you with uh, educational levels, if they're just like you, 
uh, in terms of interests, if they're just like you, in terms of socioeconomic uh, class, if they're just like you, in terms of, uh, uh, of life stage. Man, it's, it's easy to love people that are just like you. But man, what about those that are different? A different ethnicity, a different background, a different socioeconomic, a different lifestyle. Is it really easy to love? But yet, when we, when we love with God's love, that reaches across boundaries. And when we love across boundaries, it brings glory to God. I shared with a group of a girl that got on my bus. The few, um, you know, it was when the weather was turning cold last, last winter. Dad had been out of work, just got a new job, but wasn't going to get paid till uh, a month later, and uh, they were very limited on money. And uh, boy, it got cold, it got cold in a hurry. And uh, they had one of those propane gas tanks for their heat, and the gas tank was empty. And um, uh, she got on my bus one morning, and she said, you're a preacher? And I said, yeah. She said, uh, it's cold in our house. We have no heat no gas to run our heat, and uh, would you pray that uh, Dad would hurry up and get paid so that we can get gas? I did a little bit of investigative work, but uh, anonymously I made arrangements for that gas tank to be filled so uh, that family would have heat. And uh, a couple of days later she came tearing down her uh, long drive and got on my bus and she said, Man, there must really be a God because we've got heat. Don't know how it happened. Truck pulled up, had all this gas and, and uh, filled up our tank and, and somebody else paid for it. Don't even know who it paid for it, but we've got heat. There must really be a God. And I said, yeah, there is a God. And he really does love you. And I had a chance to give a gospel presentation. She went and told her folks what all I'd said about God's love, not only for her, but for them as well. I wish I could tell you, man, they responded and all of that, but uh, who knows what will take place there. But, you know, in that exchange, God was glorified. He was glorified. He was, he was showing himself true and faithful and a God of love and mercy. God is glorified when we love across all kinds of boundaries. Matter of fact, in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10, it says that, uh, that we, doing what God has called us to do, we display the manifold wisdom of God and that manifold wisdom of God might be made known. In other words, that we would make God look good, that he would be glorified, that he would show himself true and faithful. Second of all, our love models the unity of love in the triune God. In John chapter 17, if you want to look there, in verse 22, the scripture says, the glory that you have given me I have given to them, that's talking about us, that they may be one even as we are one. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I in them and you in me that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Man, the scripture says something about God, does it not? That God is love. He is perfect love. And if his love is in us because his spirit is in us, then our love models unity. It models the unity that is found in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It allows us to love in a unified way. 
Again, we're talking about unity, and there's a huge difference between unity and uniformity. I mean, we don't all talk alike. We don't all look alike. And I will tell you, that is a good thing. I'm glad that not everybody looks like me. Uh, but, you know, I like the diversity. But even in our diversity, we can be unified around those things that truly matter. What matters? Salvation. What matters is growing as a believer in Christ. What matters? Being faithful in being involved in the gospel ministry, the carrying out of the Great Commission. We're going to be unified around those things. I think you've heard um, uh, Dr. York talk about, you know, man, there's a lot of things in this church that we can disagree about. You know, we get in those staff meetings, man, if I had my way, you wouldn't be sitting in those blue hard chairs. Every room would be equipped with, with those kind of cushiony chairs that we have over there in, in room 100. These chairs are hard to sit in. They really are. They're hard to fold up and, and, and work with. But, you know, that's not a battle I, I, I want to fight. That's not really something that's going to unify us around our purpose. It's not going to unify us around Christ. You know, these walls, this carpet, it could have looked a thousand different ways. But, you know, that's not really important, is it? We can be unified and our love pulls us together, unified around those things uh, that, that, that honor the Lord. And then that last characteristic, why it's so important, uh, is that we need to remember uh, something, and I don't think I put this in your notes. Um, man, when it comes to ministry, we minister through relationships. I tell the unit, uh, interns that are around here all the time, I said, don't ever forget you will minister through relationships. Now when it comes to relationships, there are three relationships that we have. Uh, we've got the, uh, the outward relate, relate relationship, that, uh, that vertical relationship, the relationship that we have with each other. Then we have the inward relationship. That is the relationship that I have with self. And then we've got that upward relationship, that, that, that uh, vertical relationship, the relationship that we have with God. And here's how it works very simply. I cannot be rightly related with others until, first of all, I'm rightly related with myself. And I will never be rightly related with myself until I am rightly related with the Lord God. You see, when He changes your life and gives you a new perspective and a, and a new love, man, it changes you. And when you're changed and when you are in right relationship with God, you're going to be in right relationship with self. And when you're in right relationship with self, man, you're going to love one another. You're going to relate well to one another. It doesn't mean that we're always going to agree. It doesn't mean that we're always going to, uh, you know, I don't know, be perfect in those relationships. But it does mean, man, we're going to have a genuine concern. Now, an overview of Christian love I think Jonathan Edwards put it in uh, probably the best uh, uh, context. He said, love is that disposition or affection by which one is dear to another. Man, we matter. Fellowship matters. But you also understand that Christian love is hard. Now, what makes it so hard? Well, you know, we've got our sinful flesh that resists unity. 
Now, I'm going to break something to you. We are basically a selfish people. I mean, we really are. We have to work at that. I understand, man, we're born again. We, we are a new creation in Christ Jesus. But, uh, you know, we always have to watch ourselves when it comes to being selfish. Those of you with kids, those of you with several kids, uh, you know, when they play, you know, watch those children play, particularly if they're playing with their favorite toy. Do they readily share those things? I tell you, I watched my boys, man, if uh, one of them was playing with something, I mean, there could be a room full of toys. They would want to go over there and snatch the toy out of the other one's hand and say, this is mine. I mean, I didn't have to teach them how to do that. They just knew how to do that. They knew how to do that well. But boy, I had to teach them how to share. I had to teach them how to do things for other folks. My Matthew, man, he, he's got it, I think. Most days he's got it. Storms came in Versailles, tore up all of Versailles. We've got trees, limbs, still trees and limbs everywhere. But Matthew and his neighbor friend, on their own doing, uh, got in Matthew's truck, and he's got one of these big trailers that he uses for all of his lawn equipment stuff. Uh, man, they just went around to the neighbor's house and got all of their limbs and all of their branches, took it to the dump. Didn't want anything for it. They just, I think, they really got tired of looking at it. But they did that on their own. It was an act of kindness. It was something that they did that was not selfish. That would have been selfish if they had said, man, I'll take it to the dump, but it's going to cost you. You see, Christian love is hard because so many times we, we have to fight that battle about what is it that I want? What's in it for me? Second, we're called to love other sinners. Man, that's somewhat hard, isn't it? I mean, yes, we, we hate the sin, but the Scripture says that we are to love the sinners. I'm around a lot of folks, and you all are too. Some of the folks that I'm around, man, uh, it almost singes the hair that's in my eardrum, uh, you know, with some of the language that they use. You know, I don't approve of that. I don't like that. But I also know that I'm around a lot of people that are hurting, a lot of people that need a gospel witness. We can love the sinner and yet hate the sin. We love, we can love because God's love is in us. We've already talked about that. God is both the source and the model of our love. His love is in us. His spirit is in us to empower us to love with a supernatural love. And I will tell you, when the Lord got a hold of my life, I was not the most loving person in the world. Matter of fact, I didn't really even have a love for God. Didn't really even know much about the things of God. But I am glad that God continued to pursue me and I am glad that God continued to love me even when I was unloving. That's his model. And so strive to appreciate God's love for you. Again in John chapter 3 verse 16, by this we know love that he laid down his life for us, that we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. That's 1 John 3.16. So we strive to appreciate God's love and appropriate God's love. But love brings great joy. The psalmist said in Psalm um, 
Uh, 133 verse 1, Behold how good and pleasing or pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. How pleasing it is. How it brings joy to the Lord when we are loving towards each other in this fellowship of believers. Now having said all of that, what does genuine love look like? What does um, the loving fellowship look like? Well, let me give you two or three things. Uh, let me go back to my notes here and make sure. Have I gotten all the blanks turned in yet? Everybody okay? All right. What does it look like? Well, first of all, we have uh, a togetherness, a fellowship, together in diversity. Love seeks understanding. It seeks understanding. James chapter 2 tells us that we are to show no partiality. You know, as somebody said many years ago, the cross is, you know, the, the ground is level at the base of the cross. You know, we are all saved from sin. We're not saved because we're any better than anyone else. We show no per partiality. But yet, Romans chapter 12, verse 16 tells us that we live in harmony, harmony with each other. We're not going to be haughty, but yet we're going to associate with the lowly. Those that are worse off than what we might perceive ourselves to be. Those that might not have very much. Those that might be lost and, and hurting. We're going to speak to them. Man, I've been in some churches. And man, they walk around. Man, they're so prideful. And boy, they look down their noses at those that are outside the church. I mean, they say all kinds of hateful things about those sinners over there. That's being haughty. And yet the scripture says, man, a loving fellowship. We, we have a fellowship in diversity. We are together in our diversity. And we seek to understand. Those that I come into contact with that are lost, that are hurting, that might lash out or, or might have just awful behavior, I want to understand their life. I want to understand what they're going through. Man, I pulled up to a house trailer on my route to pick up one kid. And all of a sudden, seven kids came out of that house all jumping on my bus. And uh, before I could get a mile down the road, on a little old country road going about 50 miles an hour, on a, about a lane and a half of a road, um, boy, two of them got in a fight. And then the third one jumped on another one of my kids in the back. I had no place to stop. I just thought, man, if I can hurry up and get to a place where I can pull over, I hope that they don't kill each other before I can get this bus stopped. And uh, boy, you know, I had to get on all of that and uh, dealt with it. But, uh, you know, I wanted to know what was going on with those children. And I discovered that, man, there had been all kinds of abuse. They had gone from pillar to post. They were angry having to go over here to, to this aunt's house. None of them had had any breakfast. Quite frankly, I don't know that they had had anything since they ate the school lunch the day before. Most of them hadn't really slept that night. And all of a sudden you begin to find out what's going on in that family. You begin to find out what's going on with those children. And all of a sudden you have a deeper understanding of what needs they have and how you might be able to, to meet some of those needs and make life just a little bit better and be able to share with them the good news 
that God has not forsaken them, that God still loves them. And then to be thankful, man, it's only by the grace of God that I'm not there. And so we, in our diversity, we, we, we love makes us want to seek an understanding. When there's conflict even within the body, man, we want to understand. We want to, to talk to each other. We want to, to see what's going on with each other. We want to know what is happening with each other's lives. And then we're together in service. Love requires sacrifice. Sacrifice. In 1 John chapter 4 and verses 10 and 11, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Galatians chapter 6 uh, and verse 2 tells us that we are to carry each other's burdens. Man, we're going to have to know what those burdens are. We're going to have to, to share. Now, you know, out of their surplus, the, the scripture says, man, they, they uh, were together. They had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. You know, all around us are somebody that, you know, might be having a difficult time or a hard time, and, and uh, man, they need prayer support. My phone buzzed just a few minutes ago with uh, somebody, you know, texting me a, a prayer need, a prayer request. Uh, will you please pray for this? And when you respond, you're, you're helping them to, to carry that load. Sometimes, you know, people have a, a hard time, a difficult time, even in the life of the church. I mean, this church has got a number of different ministries. People trying to come over addictions. People trying to, 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 to get through various divorces. You know, people that are, uh, you know, single moms. I mean... It's just all over the place. We've got all kinds of needs. And being together, sharing together, watching after one another, we have a way of carrying each other's burdens. Something else is that we're together in truth. Our love will lead us to holiness. In Colossians chapter 3 in verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. Now what does that verse say? It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That means, man, you're going to have to know the word of God, right? You know, it's not my wisdom. It's not my words. I want the word of Christ to dwell in me richly so that we can teach accurately the word of God and admonish one another in true wisdom, in all wisdom, God's wisdom. Now, two things come out there. First is this thing of transparency. In James chapter 5, verse 16, it talks about uh, confessing our sins to one another. Man, that's accountability. I've got guys that I'm accountable to. I've got guys that we can be transparent to and share those struggles, share those failures, share those successes. Now, we don't share it with the whole world, but man, we can share with one another and, uh, and speak truth to one another. Part of our pastoral staff meeting is that of, of transparency and keeping each other accountable, praying for one another. But also that second word, not only transparency, but you've also got the word uh, proclamation in there. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15, it says, in everyday conversation, 
in those discipling relationships with our children. People that might be in a Bible study group, people that might be in our C group. Man, we are discipling in those conversations. We are speaking the truth of God's Word. Somebody comes to me about a parenting issue or a marriage issue or or, or a job situation. You know, I don't want to list out for them, you know, here's uh, 10 or 12 things that you need to do to be a successful parent. I don't want to give them the wisdom of the world. I want to give them the Word of God. How can you give somebody the Word of God? Well, first of all, you've got to know the Word of God. It's got to dwell in you richly. That means not only do you know the Word of God, but man, you are practicing the Word of God. You are putting it into practice. Also, when we proclaim it, it speaks of a gentle rebuke. You know, there are some times that we have to, to correct action or, or, or correct ideas. I had a young man that was trying to talk to me about his uh, fiance the other day. and um, The girl's mother had heard, you know, uh, man, I don't know if you all know each other well enough. I think you all just go ahead and live together for a while and, and see if it's going to work out. And she had talked to a guy in her church who said, well, you know, the Bible doesn't really say anything against that. Well, you know, what was I going to do? Man, I gave a rebuke. I said, you know, here's what the Word of God says. And I said, you know, what is fornication? Sex outside of marriage? The scripture says, you know, a fornicator will not inherit the kingdom of God. I said, one of two things is true. Either you're lost and you need to be saved, or as a believer in Christ, this is something that you will stay away from because it's not pleasing to God and God has already spoken on that issue. We speak truth in rebuke, but also we're going to share wisdom about just general patterns and, and habits of life. You know, the fact that we uh, take care of our bodies, the fact that our Bodies are a temple of the living God. Oh, you know, we want to care for it. We don't want to abuse, uh, you know, our bodies. Um, you know, we want to work hard. We want to be at our very best, uh, you know, for God's glory. Just in those everyday patterns and everyday things, you know, man, we want to, we want to speak the truth of God's Word. The fact that we are to be faithful and true and, and all of those things, uh, uh, you know, those things are important. And then, uh, fourthly, we've got the um, uh, togetherness in, 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 in forgiveness. You see that genuine love, that love of Christ that is in us, allows us to extend mercy, to be merciful. We need to forgive as the Lord forgave you. You know, it's always a hard issue. You know, for genuine forgiveness to take place, you know, there must be uh, two hearts involved. First heart is that of repentance. You know, if you want to be forgiven of your sin, the Bible tells us that we've got to repent. And then if you've wronged someone and you repent and, and, and you, you apologize or you try to make things right, that other person's going to have what I call a receptive heart. A receptive heart. That means you've got to extend forgiveness. You've got to accept forgiveness. You know where I see problems so many times? It's not when a person has wronged somebody and have repented of it. What I see more times than not is that that person that has been wronged when the wrongdoer goes and tries to make it right, the person that was wrong holds that grudge, holds that bitterness, will not forgive. 
But yet, the love of Christ allows us to extend mercy. Don't assume motives. Give people the benefit of a doubt. Look ahead to, to a perfect fellowship in eternity. Listen, there's coming a day when God's going to balance the scales. Somebody may have dealt with you unjustly. Somebody may have wronged you, and they're never going to repent. They're never going to ask for forgiveness. Uh, they're just going to go on about their merry way, and they could care less about the injustice that they have done to you. And man, you are just brooding on that. You are just saying, man, uh, you know, I'm just hoping that something bad will happen to them so I can say, man, good for you. You deserved it. No, that's not the attitude. The attitude is that, man, I know that even those that have wronged me and they're never going to do anything about it, I know that there is coming a day when God's going to make all things right. And He will balance the scale. And then, lastly, um, well, maybe not lastly, uh, E. That's where we are, right? All right, we're together in suffering. We are together in suffering. You see, love brings comfort. It does. Paul said probably best in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and verse 4, God comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. I've told you all the story before, man. I, I've survived cancer twice. Uh, you know, I know what it's like to be in the hospital. I know what it's like for that doctor to come in and, and say, man, you've only got a 17% uh, uh, chance of, uh, of surviving this. Uh, you know, I know what the chemotherapy is like. I know what the radiation is like. I know what all of those things are like. I know what it does to you. I didn't ask for the cancer. I'd just soon not have it. But you know what it did for me? Not only did uh, I go through that experience with an incredible peace that I cannot describe to you except to say that, man, God comforts you with a peace that surpasses all understanding. I knew that whether I lived or whether I died, I was going to be okay. And I knew that God didn't have to heal me from that cancer to prove to me that He loved me. I was just settled on the fact that He loved me. There were some guys that had the same deal that I had, that had the same surgery that I had on the same day. They're six feet under the ground now. God allowed me to live. That kind of gives you a different perspective on things. But also, man, when somebody calls me and says, I've got cancer, I know what that's like. As a matter of fact, there's been several folks in this church that when they get that diagnosis of cancer, uh, I'm the first one they call. And what they say to me is, you're the guy on staff that's had cancer before, I just felt like I could relate to you. I've been there. I've done that. Some of you all have gone through things that, that I've not gone through, but man, God's given you the ability for empathy and to be able to reach out and to relate to somebody that, uh, that I or somebody else might not be able to relate to. God works all things together for good if we will allow Him, even the good things and the bad things in life, so that we might be a great minister of the gospel and be able to reach out to others. And so in this fellowship of believers, we have a togetherness even in our suffering. And then we are together in one body because love considers the whole. You know, I want what is best for the church. 
I want us to be faithful and true to the mission of this church. I want God to be glorified in all things. And so what I want is for this body as a whole to honor God and to be pleasing to God in all things. Love considers the whole. What do we do? What does that mean? How does that play out? Well, let me encourage you to do several things. Um, you know, some of you are, are great teachers. Some of you can disciple others to disciple others. It comes through teaching a small group. It comes through uh, maybe being a C group leader. It may come through uh, being a part of a, of a discipleship class with our children, with our youth. I'll encourage you to do one thing. If you've got Simple Church on your phone, why not just take five or six people Start with the A's and work your way through the whole row and pray through the church directory. Pray for folks. Give generously for the good of, uh, of the church. You know, look at those opportunities to do even more so that God's work can move forward. Commit yourself, man, as long as I'm bodily able and, and healthy, I'm going to be here. I'm going to be here on Sunday mornings. I'm going to be involved in a small group, a C group. I'm going to be here on, uh, on a Wednesday night. I'm going to be involved. So what do we say in conclusion of the matter? I say all of this simply to say, we can be together in community. And that really brings us back to, to community groups, C groups. How important they are. You see, in that C group, man, we can be together in diversity. Our C groups have all ages, all stages of life. Man, how we can learn from one another, how we can understand one another. How important that is. Chrissy, and you're all C group. What does it look like? Uh, babies, all the way up to grandparents. All right. There you go. There you go. I said I wasn't going to call anybody on the front row, but, you know. But there you go. Everything from babies up to grandparents. Different ages, different stages, different interests. They don't all look the same. They don't all uh, have the same interests. But boy, they are together in Christ Jesus. In that C group, man, they can be together in service. I've seen C groups, man, they jump to it, man, when there is a need in their C group. Or even when there's a need in the church, that C group may say, listen, don't worry about that need. We'll take care of it as a group. And they do it together in service. They do it together in truth. Man, how they get in those C groups. And when they discuss the, the sermon that was preached that morning, man, they're, they're speaking truth, God's truth. Man, they are together in, in forgiveness, extending mercy to one another. Man, people come to a C group. I've been there in those C groups. And, and man, people come. Man, they've been uh, just battered and bruised by life. Maybe they have did something that wasn't God honoring. And man, instead of having a judgmental attitude, man, there is mercy that is extended. In those, in those C groups, man, there is a togetherness in, even in suffering, how we can comfort one another. C group that I've been a part of, man, we've had suicide come in there. And, and what do you say? Man, how you love one another, how you comfort one another. Just being there for one another. 
And then together, it makes the church stronger. Fellowship matters. Living in a bond of unity. Again, I just say, if you're not a part of a small group, let me encourage you to get in one. We've got some new ones that are going to form. Uh, next Sunday, we're going to have kind of a launch into uh, a new year of, uh, of community groups. And I will just tell you, if you're involved in a Sunday school class, if you're involved in a C group, when the problems of life come, I will tell you that those that are involved in a Sunday school class, those that are involved in a C group, they're just cared for in a better way. There are some people, I, you know, I minister to everybody in the church, and I will tell you when I have to go to the hospital and somebody's not involved in Sunday school, they just kind of come to church on a Sunday morning, and that's really about all their involvement. Man, I start talking about that person. Man, they're there, and, and uh, man, they've got cancer, and they're fixing to have surgery, and they've got this need and that need. And I come and I share that with the church staff, or I share that uh, with a group in the church. And people look at me and say, who is that? I don't know who they are. I don't know if I've ever met them before. And then you show them a picture, and they go, oh, yeah, I remember seeing them, but I've never known their name. I've never known anything about them. But then we've got somebody that's involved in the C group, goes to the hospital with a heart attack, and I'm telling you, before I can get there, there are C group members all in that hospital caring for children, caring for the spouse, you know, praying, mowing the yard, doing the things that, that need to be done to help that family through. I'm just saying, man, you need the fellowship of a Sunday school class, of a, of, a, of a small group that meets on a regular basis, most commonly a C group. Let me encourage you to be in community with each other because fellowship matters. And as believers in Christ, we are called to live in a bond of unity. And that unity involves God's love. And God's love never fails. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8, tells us about God's love never failing. Everything's going to pass, but God's love will remain forever. Amen? Did I get all the blanks filled in? Nobody's going to leave here upset because I didn't get a blank taken care of, right? <laughs> all right, good. We're going to go to worship, and I hope, uh, honestly, that, uh, that uh, you will consider being a part of a C group if you're not already. And um, I just pray that we'll have a great time in worship today. Let's be dismissed in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, how we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for your love and your grace that is always sufficient for our every need. I pray, Lord, that you will dismiss us to go into uh, our time of corporate worship. I pray, Lord, that there would be nothing in our heart, nothing in our spirit that would be a distraction, but that we might be able to worship you this morning in spirit and in truth. Pray, Father, for uh, Brother Chris as you uh, just anoint his words today as he uh, brings your word. And I pray, Father, that your word would go forth and, uh, and bear your fruit. Father, we thank you again for this day and this time to be together. I pray, Father, that Buck Run will always be known as a fellowship where fellowship matters and that we are together in the bond of unity and Christian love. For it's in Christ's name that we pray and ask these things. Amen.